All right, let's get started. I'm so glad to have you here today. My name is Batya Sherizen, and I've been a child sleep consultant for almost 10 years now. I help tired families teach their children how to get a better night's sleep. On today's webinar, we're going to learn the three steps to getting your baby to sleep better and how you can begin applying these ideas for better sleep immediately. I'm really excited to help you empower yourself by learning these amazing skills to help you and your child sleep. But before we start, I want to just go over a few ground rules. Number one, take notes. I'm going to be giving a lot of valuable information here, so please feel free to take notes and jot down certain ideas that speak to you. Number two, don't be distracted. Try not to be on Facebook, different social media venues. It's really hard to learn and process new information when you're not concentrating, when your mind's in a bunch of places. So if you really want to gain something here today, put all of your attention into it. Number three, stay to the end. All three steps that I'm going to be discussing are important, and if you try to apply just the first one or two independently, you really won't understand the full picture, which means you're not going to see results. And I really want you to learn a lot today and be able to practically be apply all of these ideas, so make sure you stay till the end. Number four, ask questions. If you have them at the end of the webinar, I'm going to let you know how to be in touch with me. I want to hear from you, and I definitely want to know if there's any questions that you have afterwards. So don't hesitate to reach out, which I'll tell you how to do at the end. And last but not least, don't stress. Your baby can and will learn to sleep well by slowly incorporating all the ideas we're going to discuss. So let's get ready for that. But before I begin, I want to ask you a question. Why is it that you're here today? You could be doing a myriad of other tasks as a busy parent, but instead you're here with us now to learn more about your child's sleep. Perhaps you're feeling exhausted today because your baby kept you up last night. Or maybe you're feeling frustrated because you know that your child could sleep better, but you don't know how to help him. If this is you, you are definitely in the right place. Now, one of the reasons you might be on this webinar is because you might wonder if you can ever wake up feeling rested, energized, and refreshed. You might feel like you'll never be able to tackle your busy days with a clear head again because you're up all night with your child who refuses to sleep. Or maybe you don't have the evenings to spend with your partner, with your spouse. You might be up trying to calm your crying baby instead. And because of this, you and your partner don't feel that strong connection anymore. You know, you used to stay up drinking tea, talking, and bonding, but now you just don't have time for that. Sometimes you might even feel so utterly exhausted that you don't have the proper energy to concentrate and be productive at work. It might cause your sales to be down, you might not be performing at work nearly as well as you know you can, and you might feel like you're really stuck in a rut. So if this is you, don't worry. It doesn't have to be like this. We can most definitely teach your child how to sleep so your life can be better and you can function in that optimal, rested place. We're going to talk about using three gentle, surefire steps to get your baby sleeping. And once we do that, picture how energized you'll feel, waking up rested and refreshed, ready to face the day. So you can take care of your to-do list and actually cross things off and get things done and accomplished. You won't be scurrying around tired trying to do this and that. You'll actually get that to-do list done. What would it be like? if you had uninterrupted time in the evenings to bond with the people you love so you could rebuild that connection with your partner and have that amazing relationship again. The result could be date nights, going out to dinner once in a while, or even just reconnecting with old friends and relationships like you used to pre-baby days, just feeling like you finally have time to yourself. Imagine how productive and focused your work could be when you have a full night's sleep and a level head for your busy day. It'll mean that your numbers are up again, your boss will love you, you might even be on time or early to your meetings. All those creative juices will be flowing and you'll feel good and enjoy, enjoy your work in general. But even if you're not working, just to have a clear head to concentrate on all the busy tasks at hand because we all know parenting in and of itself is a full-time job, okay? So whether or not you're working in an office or just working at home, just to have that energy and concentration level to be able to really function at your best. Now, the only way to get from where you are now to where you want to be is to regain control of your sleep and regain control of your life by applying these fail-proof methods to teach your child how to sleep. It is not realistic, it's not unrealistic at all to have energy and time with the people you love in your life. But in order to do this, you have to work with a solid foundation. You have to work from the ground up. Just like when you're building a skyscraper, you don't start on the 20th floor. 
or the 18th floor or the fifth floor or even the first floor, you start with building a solid foundation just like this pyramid and you work from the ground up. And in this three-step solution, we're going to help you do exactly that. I'm going to walk you through how to build that foundation so you have a really, really solid place to start with your child's sleep. But before I tell you about that, I want to just tell you a little bit about my story and how I came to be doing what I do because some things I say will definitely identify with you and your current situation. So let me take you back to August 2006. I was living in an apartment in Jerusalem with my husband and baby. My baby was 10 months old and we were all absolutely exhausted. It was 1 a.m. and I had spent almost two hours for the umpteenth time trying to get my baby to sleep. I had tried feeding him, he wasn't hungry. I had tried holding him, he was too squirmy. I even tried taking him for a walk outside at that hour, but nothing was working. I was on the edge and I needed to do something now to get him to sleep. How many of you have ever felt like that? Not coping and at that very scary place of needing sleep and needing it now? So, guess what I did? Anything any sleep-deprived mother would have done, I desperately looked for a distraction. I scooped up my baby, brought him into the messy kitchen that happened to have looked like a tornado had hit. You know, there was spaghetti strewn all over the counters, pots and pans left over from last night's dinner. It was a total mess because, my goodness, who has time to clean up when you're so utterly tired? I opened up all of the cabinets looking for something to save me, and there it was, the box of Cheerios. Wow. Thank God. I grabbed the Cheerios and my baby, brought them into the living room, and continued to dump the entire contents of the Cheerios box onto the floor. I found a blanket, collapsed on the couch, and prayed my baby would be entertained for as long as possible so I could catch some sleep. Batya, what's going on? Batya, can you hear me? Wake up. It's almost 3 a.m. and the entire living room looks like Hurricane Cheerios has hit. The cereal on the floor stuck to the baby's cheeks and you're sleeping on the couch. Batya, I know you are tired, but this isn't normal. There has to be a better way to get some rest. Something has to change. Can you relate to this? Being so utterly drained from your baby's lack of sleep and knowing that you're absolutely at the end of your rope? Let's fast forward three months. We're still living in our apartment in Jerusalem, but it's now 6.30 a.m. and I had gone to sleep the night before at 11 p.m. Good morning, wake up, it's time to go to work. That was the sound of me waking my husband up. What's going on? What time is it? And why are you smiling and looking rested? The baby slept the entire night last night. Can you believe it? It was a blissful moment, the first time my baby actually slept through the night. Can you imagine what that felt like? Finally having seven hours of sleep behind me and waking up in the morning with a smile on my face. I can't believe it. I can't believe we finally got to this place, Batya. It looks like all of your research really paid off. Oh, I know. And even though I got confusing advice from everyone, that's what led me to learning about the science behind sleep. And I think I finally figured it out. Let's fast forward another two years. At that point, I had not only helped my baby sleep, but I'd worked with hundreds of other families as well. But have you ever felt absolutely stumped with a situation, a problem that seems almost unsolvable? One morning at 9.30 a.m., I was sitting down to enjoy my morning coffee when I got the call that changed my life. You know that moment when you realize there is way more potential than you ever dreamed of? Batya, you are a miracle worker. Ryan slept beautifully for the past three nights. Wow, I was speechless. Batya, when I called you eight weeks ago, I never would have believed he could do it. Remember how it took at least two hours at bedtime to calm him down? He was so tired. He would jump on the dressers, bang his head on the wall, run in and out of the room. He just eventually passed out on the floor because he was so exhausted. Do some of you think that your child is the worst sleeper that can possibly exist? This mother felt that way and didn't think anyone would be able to help her. But with this child, I felt like I had cracked the code. I had helped the nightmare child, the child that would never learn to sleep. I had helped him fall asleep easily and calmly at bedtime and sleep through the night. It had taken a few weeks of hard work, but at that moment, I knew that if I could help him sleep, I could help any child sleep. Let's fast forward to today. It's nearly 10 years later, and I run a full-time consulting service helping families all over the world. I do personalized one-on-one -on -one coaching with families every day. We get to the root of their child's sleep problems, and we solve them. I love my business and I love helping fellow parents empower themselves by getting the sleep they need and deserve. I work with cute kids like this guy here, Beckham. When Beckham's parents contacted me, Beckham was seven months old, 
and his parents had tried everything because Beckham was up all night crying and having bottles. They had tried leaving him to cry on his own. They had tried checks of going in the room and out of the room. They had tried picking him up and calming him down and putting him down and everything under the sun, but nothing had worked. We worked together for an intense few weeks and we got him sleeping through the night, but more than that, he was sleeping in his own crib in his own room. His parents were absolutely thrilled. So that's a little bit about me. Now let's talk about you again. Let's talk about challenges and problems that you might potentially face that I've seen happen a lot with the families I work with when you try to teach your child to sleep. Because remember, we don't want to waste time here. If you're going to be working on teaching your child to sleep, let's do it right, okay? So the first question that most people run into is where to start, how to start. Should I go full force with tackling my baby's nights in one go? Do I put my baby in a crib and just start from there? How do I begin teaching my baby to sleep? Do I do it with naps, with the night? How, where do you begin and how do you go about this? So that's the first question most people encounter. Second challenge is will it work with my baby? Okay, I read a success story in a mom's Facebook group about how my friend's baby did great with sleep training, but that doesn't mean that my baby will respond the same way. What about my baby's temperament, my parenting philosophy and needs? What about you know, what I think is important as a parent and my child's personality. That's the second challenge people face. Third is what about the future? Okay, great, Batya. This all sounds fine and dandy, and, but once I do figure this all out and get my baby sleeping, how do I know what will be in the future? Just because I got my child sleeping well now, what do I do if problems arrive in, in the future? Do I have to start all over again? Does everything get uprooted? How does this work? So let's just sum up these three problems again. Number one. Starting, where to start, how to start. Do I start with bedtime? Do I start with naps? Do I start just by putting my baby in a crib? Where's the best starting point? Second question, will it work with my baby? My baby's temperament and personality, my parenting philosophy and what I think is important, my family dynamics in my home. Third question, the future. What do I do when future regressions and hurdles come up? What do I do when my baby's schedule changes? What do I do when my baby gets sick? How do I deal with future issues that arise to make sure that everything isn't thrown off? What we want to do here with anything with our child's sleep is we want to create long-term solutions. Asking all these questions is great because they really address key fundamental problems that people encounter when they teach their children how to sleep. They are common stumbling blocks and you have to know how to deal with them in order to teach a baby how to sleep with long-lasting results. You know, when I first started coaching families, I found that they really lacked addressing these challenges and oftentimes they were solving a problem, of a symptom of the problem, not the root. If you look at this picture here, like this tree, it's the roots of the tree, it's the bottom, and that's where you have to start with everything because if you just try to cut off one of the branches here, you're not really getting to anything in detail. So the Serenity Sleep Solution that I've created addresses all of these things, and we're going to go through this in detail on today's webinar, and you're going to have a clear blueprint by the end of this webinar to understand how to make a game plan to tackle your child's sleep. Number one, where to start, how to start. We always start with the child's routine. We start with regulating their body to ensure they're sleeping at the times we want. We're going to go into that in detail. The second problem, will it work with my baby, my dynamics in my home, my parenting philosophy, how I feel? That we're going to talk about a lot with independent sleeping, catering a game plan to your child and your home and everything that's important to you. And the third question is the future. Dealing with future issues, future regressions, future challenges. We talk about this with the sleep line. Fusing all sleep together for the future to make sure that you always have things intact. So on this webinar, like I said, I'm going to go through all three of these steps so you can learn how to apply them and get your child sleeping immediately. So let's get started with going through that. Number one, I want to go through routine. And what I'm going to talk about here with routine is the foundations of sleep. Getting a really solid foundation set so you can have that baseline with your child's sleep to move forward. Now, the biggest problem that parents encounter when teaching their child to sleep, like I said, is when and how to start. Do I start with naps? Do I start with bedtime, middle of the night? Do I do it all in one go? What is the best way to tackle this? And these questions are really critical because you have to first figure out the optimal time to introduce sleep for your child before ever starting. All sleep is a 24-hour cycle. Day affects night, which affects the following day. You know, general rule of thumb is that sleep induces sleep, and the better rested your child is, the easier he'll go down, the longer he'll sleep, the happier he'll wake up, and this rolling positive cycle begins, and we want to work with your child's natural rhythms. We don't want to just force him into something that we think is appropriate if that's not what his body wants to do. Many parents contact me who've tried dozens of methods getting their child to sleep, and let's say they decided 7 p.m. was the optimal bedtime, but 
What if 7 p.m. was not the best time for your baby's body? What if he was overtired? What if it wasn't the opportune time to get him to sleep? 70% of the problem is often lack of routine because you're forcing your child into unnatural rhythms. A routine is a preventative key to fighting this overtiredness. Now, you might think you have a great routine set in place, and it's possible that you have tried getting your child to sleep, but you might have been doing so at the wrong times and your child is simply overtired. And when he's overtired, he's going to fight sleep so much more. So we want to make sure we set things up properly by getting this foundation set and working with your baby's natural rhythms. Now, overtired can mean a lot of things. It can mean not getting enough sleep. It can mean sleeping enough, but not at the right time. So keep in mind, your baby could be suffering from one of these or all of these. So Aside from battling overtiredness, another benefit of a routine is that it enables you to predict your child's needs as they come. It lessens your baby's irritability drastically. Your, do your baby doesn't have to cry because he's exhausted, because he's overtired, or because he's ridiculously hungry, because you're able to fill his needs as they come, and you have that confidence to give him his needs. You don't have to play guessing games when your baby's upset. Is he hungry? Is he overstimulated? Does he need to go back to sleep? You have an outline of his days, and you're simply able to flow with that instead of allowing exhaustion, allowing irritability to set in. You really prevent it before it even happens to begin with. Now, you might get nervous when I say routine, thinking that it means being enslaved to the clock minute by minute or having a rigid, confining play by play, but a routine is quite the opposite. It's completely liberating. It's really just a sequence of events, a general flow to your day. My baby usually eats at this time, is normally happy within these hours, tends to get tired at that hour. You know, your child's not a robot. But if your daily routine can be more or less on par, it will range within a half hour of normalcy and that you have a guide. All of us function like this as adults. We all function on predictability. You know, if we weren't sleep deprived here, most of us would go to sleep around the same time every day. Most of us get hungry for lunch around the same time of day. Babies are miniature people and we are all creatures of habit. We all thrive on some level of predictability and general order to our days. So that's just the framework of what a routine is, why it's so important, because you really have to get this in line before you ever even teach your baby how to sleep. Having this routine confidently helps you help your children. It's a fundamental key baseline to ensuring that a child sleeps well so you can work with his natural rhythms and get this in gear. Okay, so that's the importance of a routine. Let's talk about the foundations of a routine as the foundation is really, really critical to making headway with your child's sleep. Now, I'm going to say a, a routine is important, but a routine is only as good as how it's introduced beforehand. What do I mean by this? how you wind your child down before he actually goes to sleep. It gets his body in gear and it helps him become consciously aware that sleep is coming. So once your baby approaches this ideal time that you've designated for sleep, there's a few key ideas to help him transition to a calmer state before he actually falls asleep. All children have an ideal time to go to sleep. We just discussed getting a solid routine set in place and it's that ideal time that your child's body is naturally ready for sleep. Now, I don't mean that your baby's gonna magically drift off to dreamland at this time. It just means that there's an opportune time here to encourage sleep. At this time, the hormones are being produced evenly throughout your baby's body and he's relaxed in this great, great place in his body to go to sleep. But what happens if you miss this opportune moment and you wait longer to put him to sleep? You think logically that all these hormones get distributed, your baby gets more and more tired and just passes out, but as you know, the exact opposite is the case. When this opportune sleep window is missed, your baby gets wired, he gets inconsolable, he's overtired, he fights sleep even more. You know, you might think of it as a second wind, but really it's just your baby showing signs of distress and telling you he needs to go to sleep even faster. So. That's why it's really critical to catch your baby at the time when he's ready and not wait too long because when you wait too long, you're just setting him up to fight sleep even more. Okay, so that's a really critical thing to understand here. Let's work with his body when he's ready to go to sleep. So practically speaking, what can you do to get this opportune sleep window set? Number one, keep your eyes on your baby. I suggest maybe taking a log, logging his habits, and seeing when the opportune times are so when he gets tired. Don't wait till he's rubbing his eyes. Don't wait till he's fidgety and pulling his ears because the likelihood is at that point you've waited too long. If he's already crying or protesting, that means he's missed that window. So if you see for a consecutive few days that he gets tired at 10 a.m., don't wait till 10. Start winding him down at 9.45. And that's the second step here is winding your baby down to sleep and preempting sleep to help his body get in that place. The closer you get to your baby's ideal window, the more dangerous territory you enter. So like I said, if your goal is to have your baby asleep by 7 p.m., 
then at 6.45, before you reach that window, start getting him into a less stimulated atmosphere and encourage relaxation. Take your baby out of the busy lights, the stimulating atmosphere, into a calmer room. Change his diaper, hold him, cuddle him, sing to him quietly. As long as it's in a nice, relaxing atmosphere, his body will be able to wind down for sleep. Doing this will help him transition into relaxation mode before crankiness sets in. You know, none of us will go on a five-mile run and jump into our bed and say, great, let's go to sleep. Because we need time to get from point A to point B. We need time to go from stimulating, exciting, lights, dance, peekaboo, peekaboo, all these different games to sleep. So you need to have a transitional time in between. Yes, some babies can transition easily from various environments, but most babies need ample time to relax and calm down. So realize that although getting your baby to sleep at this ideal window is critical, it's not the only factor. You have to also make sure you wind him down properly, you know. When one of my daughters was two years old, we had a really solid ritual set in place before she went to sleep. We'd go into her room, turn off the lights, close the shades, then she'd put her head on my shoulder. I'd sing her a quick lullaby, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, I'd place her in a crib and I'd leave. Sometimes if I had a little bit more time, I'd sing a little bit longer, but the whole process never took longer than a few minutes. And we did this every time before she took a nap, before she was a a newborn. She knew that every time we went into her room, we turned off the lights, she'd put her head on my shoulder, I'd sing a song, and she'd go to sleep without question. She didn't think we were eating lunch. She didn't think we were going to the park or playing with siblings. She knew sleep was coming because she had learned to associate these cues with sleep. And because we had done the same thing every single day, there was no question in her mind what was about to happen. So this whole concept is so your baby can learn to follow these predictable cues and know that sleep is coming. It's just going to help him fall asleep easier and it's going to help him fall asleep faster. So do these calming activities that you can to encourage sleep. Like I said, a dark room, baby massage, baby massage, soft singing. Even if your baby's eyes don't suddenly droop when you're doing these things during the wind down process, he's still getting the message. And the more you repeat it, the more your baby's going to learn to internalize it. So now that we've talked about that, let's talk about how to actually apply your routine. Once you know the times, and once you know how to preempt sleep and get your baby's body calm by not letting him get overtired, Remember, a routine is never going to be precise and it's never going to be exact. It shouldn't be. We're working with babies here, not machines, okay? So you will be pleasantly surprised that after just a short amount of time incorporating consistency to your baby's day, and this is whether you have a two-week-old or a two-year-old, you're going to see that the majority of your child's sleep fighting will have drastically minimized. And the next logical question to ask yourself, though, is how to actually establish a routine. And that's what we're going to discuss here, the when but not the how. There might be a myriad of problems you're having with your baby. You might feel like your baby's sleep is completely erratic. There's no consistency. Or you might feel like every time you are successful at getting your baby to sleep, you try to put them down, the whole merry-go-round process begins again. You know, Whatever your personal story is, we're not going to focus it on how to get a baby to sleep until you confidently know when his body needs to be sleeping. And I say yet, because don't worry, we're going to get to that soon, okay? But whether or not you have an infant or a toddler, we're just going to discuss working on the when of sleep. And the when is the routine. So when trying to incorporate your routine, do your best to get your baby to sleep, basically, no matter what it takes. If your baby needs to be held to sleep, fine. If your baby needs to be rocked in a stroller to wind down, no problem. If you have to sit with your toddler for an hour at bedtime, don't worry about it. You have to first focus on on just regulating his body to want to sleep at these times. And then once that's in place, we can work on teaching him how to sleep. So your short-term goal should be that when you know sleep time is arriving, make sure it happens. And this holds especially true for younger babies. The goal here is to have your baby asleep at the times you've designated for your routine, not to start the wind down process then. Prevent your baby from becoming overtired like we discussed a few minutes ago. The goal here is just to get this when in place. And if you need to use certain dependencies or certain crutches in order to get that, fine. At this stage in the game, just work on the when. In the next step, I'm going to discuss how to teach your baby to sleep. But this routine is a key fundamental to moving forward. So let me ask you a question. How many of you feel like you have a solid routine in place that suits your baby's needs? Do you feel like there's one time of the day that you're confident with? Maybe when bedtime happens, certain naps that arrive, or maybe your mornings. Try to write that down, take some notes on your own, and see if you can ascertain any consistency with your child's sleep so you can have that as a baseline to build upon. So I'm just going to summarize what this routine is. A solid sleep routine is the foundation to teaching your baby how to sleep. Otherwise, you're just solving symptoms of the problem and you're not getting to the root of them. Okay, let me show you an example. This is baby Emma here seven months old. 
When her parents contacted me, she had no structure whatsoever to her days. Her mom had tried everything, and Emma was just really unhappy, and honestly, she cried a lot. So what we did was we actually logged her habits for a few days, and we created an ideal routine for her. We figured out this whole when, this whole routine, and we built upon that before we taught her how to sleep. We saw from the logs, I saw that she needed two more naps that she was getting, and she simply couldn't stay awake as long as her mother thought she could, and that's why she was so irritable and so exhausted, because she was just overtired, and she was crying because she needed more sleep. So once we got that in gear, we got her to be such a happier baby. She would play on the floor for a long time by herself. She would coo and smile. Obviously, you know, it's not always songs and dance and lullabies, because babies are babies, but her general temperament improved drastically because she's just getting more rest. So it's really important that you make sure you're working with your baby's natural rhythms before you move forward with his sleep. Okay, so that's routine that we spoke about here. Now what I want to talk about here is independent sleeping, which was that second question. Once you have the routine in place, how do you actually teach your baby how to sleep and how do you know it's going to be in line with your parenting philosophy and actually going to work? So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about getting to the root of your child's sleep problems by making sure we have a solid game plan to move forward. So let's first talk about why your baby is waking up. You might be asking yourself, okay, Batya, that sounds great. I understand the routine. I understand the importance. But I actually have to teach my baby how to sleep once this baseline is in place. And you know what? You are totally right, okay? Let's talk about the science of sleep, how sleep works, and why your baby's waking up to begin with. Babies have various sleep cycles and rhythms just like adults do. REM, non-REM, deeper sleeps, lighter sleeps. And this very dramatically affects not only how your baby sleeps, but how he wakes up, which is where the problem begins. I doubt any of you are here today because you're having issues with your baby's sleep. You're having issues that your baby's waking up. That's the problem, okay? So here's what's happening. Your baby has something called a sleep cycle. During the day, the sleep cycle is usually around the 30 to 50 minute mark, depending on your child's age. In the night, the sleep cycles become longer. They become deeper. For this sleep cycle to fall asleep initially, let's say baby falls asleep in scenario one, being rocked to sleep in his mother's arms. He falls into a deep sleep, and as the 30 to 50 minute mark slowly approaches, he begins to complete his first sleep cycle. He's about to transition to his next sleep cycle, and what happens at that moment is he experiences something called a partial awakening. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's when your baby basically becomes partially awake, semi-aware of his surroundings. He checks everything out, checks out his environment, makes sure he's in a safe environment, everything's normal, sees the same cues, and then goes back to sleep. By the way, you and I do this as well. We might fluff our pillows, rearrange our covers, or do something else in our half-asleep state just to remain comfortable and make sure that things are safe. But what's going on here? Why is your baby having such a difficult time transitioning to the next sleep cycle? Why is this partial awakening preventing him from having solid sleep? So think about it this way. Your baby fell asleep in scenario one, right? We said baby fell asleep in his mother's arms. After he was asleep, his mommy put him down in the crib. Now, baby has this partial awakening in which he wakes up, semi-aware of his surroundings, begins to check things out, and, oh no, suddenly he realizes he's no longer in mommy's arms. He's in this cold crib all by himself. Wait a minute, he thinks to himself, I want that first scenario back. Mommy, please hold me back to sleep. I want to be pressed up against your warm body again. I don't want to be here alone. I want to be held so I can fall back asleep. Baby is now completely awake, and what initially started just as a partial awakening has turned into a full-blown protesting spell. Baby now woke up and needs you to recreate that sleep environment to fall asleep, and that's why he wakes up throughout the night. That's why he can't have long naps. He needs you to constantly help him recreate his initial sleep environment when he has these partial awakenings. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you how exhausting and draining that can be. So the goal is to teach your child to fall asleep in the same scenario he's going to have these partial awakenings in. That way he can independently transition from sleep cycle to sleep cycle. You know, he can fall asleep in one place, complete that sleep cycle, have this partial awakening, and transition back to sleep, all while remaining in the same sleep environment. You know, I was recently working with a mother, and she put it in a very funny way, but it's true. She said, okay, Batya, you know, this makes sense. I wouldn't be too happy if I fell asleep in my big comfy bed with my comforter, and I woke up on the cold kitchen floor. So it's exactly what it is. Most children suffer from this inability to transition from sleep cycle to sleep cycle. And what they're dependent on to help them is this next slide here called a sleep dependency, okay? Now, a sleep dependency might portray itself in many ways. Your baby might continuously need his pacifier to sleep, or he might need to nurse every hour in the night, or he might only fall asleep being held or being rocked. You could probably make your own list, but these dependencies steal your sleep as parents. You are the one who's popping the pacifier back in. You are the one feeding your baby, doing this whole song and dance to get your baby to sleep, and it's a real issue for everyone, not only your baby, because you are the one sleep-deprived, helping your baby get back to sleep. So. 
first of all, don't worry. Many parents fall into this trap of doing anything they can to get their baby to sleep, and it's understandable. You're tired, and in a pure desperation and exhaustion, you do whatever you can to get your baby to sleep. But it can become a problem, and that's why you're here today. Your baby's crying. You want to rock him to sleep. Baby's still crying. You nurse him to sleep. You might even bring your child into your bed numerous times at night to do whatever you can because you just want to get sleep now. And I know how tempting it can be to fall into these patterns. It's a quick fix makes life easier, but this is where all the sleep dependencies get more and more entrenched and suddenly you have a baby that wakes up every hour to eat or a toddler that needs you to continuously lay with him in bed for the hundredth time in the middle of the night. Your child is dependent on something or someone to help him transition back to sleep and that's what's preventing him from having better naps, longer nights, and better quality sleep. You know, a mother contacted me recently with a 10-month-old baby big heavy guy, his sleep dependency was that he would only fall asleep being held standing when she was standing up in a non-stationary position. So what does that mean? Holding him and standing up and doing lunges, holding him and rocking him. He could not be tricked by the rocking chair or if she was sitting down. So her nights would look as follows. He'd wake up, she'd pick him up, hold him anywhere between five minutes and 45 minutes. He'd fall asleep. She'd put him back down, pray to the dear Lord he'd stay asleep. Half the time he wouldn't. Half the time he would. Pick him back up. Start the whole song again. again you know, so you get the picture. We're going to talk about different ideas that exist to tackle these sleep dependencies, but I just wanted to make sure you understood what it was that we're facing here because that's what's keeping your child up. So let's talk about alternate solutions that exist to solve these sleep dependencies and get rid of them. The most widespread idea is something called cry it out. Now, this big question, to cry or not to cry, you know, that's what everyone's trying to wonder these days and trying to figure out what speaks to them. But the most, most commonly used sleep training method is called cry it out. This basically means putting your baby in his crib or bed, in a room by himself, and leaving him to scream himself to sleep. The goal here is he eventually learns to settle to sleep because there's no sleep dependencies, right? He fell asleep by himself. He wakes up, has these partial awakenings, he's by himself, and then he transitions back to sleep. Theoretically, it works, but many parents shudder at the idea of leaving their babies to cry. If you've done it, I don't have any judgments, no problems, but I'm just here to give you a technical rundown of the ideas that exist, and I'm going to tell you why I don't like these ideas, and then I'm going to tell you what I've created that I do like. So cry it out can work, but like I said, a lot of children are fine, but others have very drastically ne negative responses. Some children might learn to sleep beautifully in three nights while crying alone, but another might feel traumatized. He might feel alone. He might fight sleep even more, never really learn to sleep well, and I'm honestly not a fan of this method. There is no blanket statement that says all personalities will mold to this, okay? So that's why I don't like cry it out. Let's talk about another method, the opposite extreme, the ones that claim there's no crying involved whatsoever. So let's say night one, you hold your baby till he's asleep, then you place him down. Night two, you hold him till he's drowsy and starting to fall asleep, and then place him down. Night three, you just place him down, but if he cries or protests, you pick him up and then hold him a little bit more until you put him down. And it's a back and forth constantly. And where does this get him? Get you? Absolutely nowhere. You have to find, to find even a completely tear-free approach that actually works, I have to tell you, doesn't seem to exist. Because in this scenario, your baby still has a sleep dependency of being held to sleep. So parents usually burn out when they try methods like this because their baby doesn't magically learn to drift off because anytime he protests, his behavior just gets reinforced. So let's talk about a checking system, an in-between method, so to speak. Ferber, for example, theoretically is the in-between. It's basically when you leave your baby at progressively longer intervals so he learns how to fall asleep, but he still has the reassurance from his parents. So let's say you put him in his crib, leave him for three minutes to cry, then you go in. Go back out, leave him for five minutes and go back in. Then leave him for 10 minutes and go back in. You know, each night has a cap getting progressively longer and longer. And the eventual goal is that the intervals get longer and your baby learns to sleep while parents still feel like they're responding to their child. Does it work? Yeah, many times it does. But the problem is that a child is still left to cry alone for sometimes 20 to 30 minutes on his own. And an even bigger problem is that not all temperaments respond well to this. One might be fine, while another might get completely overstimulating mixed messages. Wait a minute, mommy. Sometimes you leave me here and you don't come in. Other times you come in and reassure me. What am I supposed to learn here or to expect? Many parents call me who've tried this method and they don't seek this text. And as parents, we always want to instill trust with our kids. It all boils down to ensuring that your child feels emotionally secure. Different kids respond differently based on their temperament. The goal is to take your child's individual temperament and personality into account, your own parenting philosophy, and figuring out what works for you. Because you shouldn't ever feel like you're compromising your own beliefs or doing something that you know won't work for your child in your situation. I've created a middle ground solution. I call it the gentle phase-out method. 
It's what I use with all the families I work with. It's basically a slow, progressive intervals of facing yourself out of the picture. You can mold it to any age or any situation. In the beginning, you might help your child a lot by rubbing his back, by talking to him. And every few nights, you lessen your interaction, you lessen your intervention. Sometimes you're moving further away. Sometimes you're talking less. Sometimes you're touching less. Depends on each situation. But the ultimate goal is that your child always gets a consistent message from you and he feels safe knowing that you're there. And in turn, that security helps him slowly acclimate to learn to self-soothe on his own without having such a strong sleep dependency. So like I said, I use this method for every family that I'm working with, but we have to mold it to each individual circumstance because every situation is different. You know, I spend two, three weeks alone creating a tailor-made gentle phase-out method but that's just the general idea of ensuring that you're constantly responding to your child. They learn that when I do X, my parent does Y, and from that you can slowly, slowly mold your response based on how they progress through everything. You want to make sure your child feels secure while you get out of the picture slowly. Doing this slowly and seeing how your child responds, like I said, is critical to ensuring that you have permanent results with his sleep. So let me ask you a question. Now that you know what a sleep dependency is and what your issues are, what do you feel like your sleep, child's sleep dependency is? Do you, you have issues with rocking, pacifier, being nursed, bottles? You know, one parent contacted me recently and she had a two-year-old that would only fall asleep while the baby was driven around in the car, whether it was 1 a.m., 5 a.m. So his sleep dependency was a lot of different things. It was the motion of the car. It was being strapped, being sitting up. They didn't even own a crib. So sleep dependencies can manifest themselves in many different ways. So I want you to think about what your child's sleep dependency is. All right, the key to teaching your baby to fall asleep is by tackling your child's sleep dependency while taking into account, like I said, his personality and your parenting philosophy because it's really important that you do things based on what's good for you. And you can't just put your child in a box and say, well, he's 10 months old, so this and this has to work for him. No, you have to make sure that you create a game plan that's really tailored to you. This cute guy here is Gavin, okay? Now, when Gavin's parents contacted me, he was almost three years old, and he refused to stay in his bed at night. His parents had to coax him for hours on end. They felt like their three-year-old was running the show. His sleep dependency was that his mom had to sit with him for at least an hour, hour and a half every night rubbing his back. And if she would try to sneak away before he was asleep, forget it. It was all over. She had to start the whole thing again. So we created a gentle method where we slowly got him acclimated to learning to calm his body down. We did charts and stickers, and we made him feel like a million dollars in the process. We worked together for five weeks, and after that, he was actually telling his parents he was tired and that he wanted to go to sleep, which was amazing. Okay, so we spoke about routine. We just spoke about independent sleeping and working with your child, and I told you about the methods I don't like and what I do like and why it's so critical to ensure you use something gentle that's catered to you. Let's talk about the sleep line which is the last challenge that you'll face. Future regressions, future challenges, how to make sure that you can not be thrown off by setbacks, by hurdles, by schedule changes, okay? Now, you might be thinking what I'm saying sounds great, but let's say that you spend time sleep training now and future regressions happen. You know, many times subbing blocks occur down the road that can take your sleep away. You might work on your child's sleep now and then have something arise in the future that throws it off. You know, a new baby comes, you travel, your child gets sick, grandma visits, life is life. And we all know the only constant we can ever rely on with our kids is that they are always changing. So the goal is to view sleep as a line. Sometimes you might veer a little to the right, sometimes you might veer a little to the left. It's never going to be perfect because life is never perfect. But you know, your baby learns to sit up. He can't get back down. He learns to climb out of his crib. He's potty training. He gets shots. He has a fever. You travel. The list is endless. So you want to ensure you have something called a sleep line really strongly in place so that way you don't get too thrown off it. You might veer a little to the right. You might veer a little to the left. But you never deviate too far from that sleep line to ensure you can get right back on. And it's critical to have this sleep line in place because otherwise life's challenges will always be throwing you for a game. You're going to be jumping back and forth all the time with your child's sleep. So you want to make sure you have it in place. So let's talk about what you can do. How about an example here? When your child gets sick. Your baby sleeps great, but he gets sick. Suddenly, your baby that used to sleep through the night is up having, you know, bottles every two hours. But what happens when he's better? One night of having bottles again turns into two, turns into ten, and suddenly you notice, wow, our baby was sleeping through the night for three months. Now he's better, he's not sick anymore, but now he's up every single hour in the night. What do you do? Obviously, when a baby is sick, you give him as much TLC as he needs, as much emotional reassurance, physical reassurance. That's our job as parents, to make sure we give our kids what they need. You might even bring him into your bed with you. Of course, when he's sick, you have to make sure that everything is intact and that he gets what he needs. But, and I say a big but, 
Old habits can be forgotten very quickly and new ones take shape faster than you realize. So once he gets better, get right back to that sleep line. Make sure he's back in his crib. Make sure you have those, you know, different routines set in place so he can get back on because you don't want to veer too far away from your sleep line. And when you're giving your child his needs, the goal is not obviously to leave a sick child screaming in his, ba in his crib, God forbid. You know, you're his parent. You want to be there for him. But when he gets better, to make sure regressions don't happen, you want to get back to your sleep line. Let's say travel or jet lag. You might, you know, go to a different place and at home your baby sleeps in his own room and you sleep in your own room and that's great. But now you're staying at your aunt's house and you're all in the same room. Your baby's looking at you all night and crying because he sees you or he's playing peekaboo. The same rule applies to when he was sick. You have to roll with the punches while you're away. Deal with it when you can, but when you get back home, get right back on your sleep line. When you're traveling, do your best to maintain normalcy. Don't revert back to the old habits and do whatever you can to not be too thrown off. But right when you get back home, he goes back in his own crib. You teach him the rules again. You might have to remind him or reteach him for a night or two, but it's not as if you have to sleep train and spend weeks and weeks and weeks on it and teaching him something that he's already familiar with. You just want to make sure he gets back in gear. So tell me a little bit. You can think of five obstacles or five sleep challenges you can think of that can throw your child's sleep off teething, holidays, traveling, jet lag. Maybe it's something that you've experienced, something that you are going to be experiencing soon. Just think about different things that can possibly cause regressions and throw your sleep off. Having a new baby, you know, the list is endless, but whatever your personal story is, it's important that you make a game plan to make sure you stay on that sleep line. In order to prevent sleep regressions in the future, you need, need this solid sleep line in place. That way you don't veer too far off track with your baby's sleep, and that's a really, really important fundamental. Let me give you an example. This is Anna and her baby brother, Donnie. Now, they both slept great independently, and then mom tried to get them into the same room, and when she did, everything went haywire. They were waking each other up. It was basically a disaster pajama party. So we had to first get them both, both back into their own individual sleep lines so they could all get sleep. We had to take some steps back. Mom had to reteach them individually how to sleep well while keeping them together and laying the ground rules. We had to help them acclimate to each other's noises, become less sensitive. Patience is key, but within a week and a half, two weeks, they were, they were able to sleep through the night again in the same room together, but it was just a matter of getting them back in gear into their own individual sleep lines and fusing that together. So that is basically the three system, okay? Just to sum it up, we spoke about the three problems. We spoke about where to start, how to start, knowing what to do, days, naps, bedtime, mornings, cribs, what do you do? You start from the ground up with the foundations of sleep and a routine, knowing that your baby's body is in his optimal rhythms for sleep. We spoke about catching that opportune sleep window. We talked about helping him wind down to catch him at that window, not waiting too long so he gets overstimulated and created a, creating a really nice, calm ambiance for sleep. We spoke about just focusing on when, even if it means you need to teach your child to sleep later on, holding him, rocking him, doing whatever possible to get his body acclimated. Once you have that in place, we spoke about getting to the root of your child's sleep dependencies. What's stopping your child from falling asleep, what's stopping your child from transitioning back to sleep, and how you can make a solid game plan based on your child's personality, your philosophy, and what you feel is important. I spoke about the methods that exist, why I don't like cry it out, why I don't like checking systems, why gentle methods have yet to even have any solution and work. And I spoke about my gentle phase out method and why it's so critical to give your child emotional security and give them a consistent response. Then we spoke about just now the sleep line, future, regressions, challenges, setbacks, hurdles, how to get back to your sleep line and really make sure that life is life, you get thrown off, as, but the most important thing is that when you're back to your normal habits, you get right back in gear and get right back to your sleep line. So I'm really happy that you came here today. You learned a lot of valuable opportunities information to help your child sleep, but I do have to be honest, this was really just an overview. Now, I did my best to pack in as much as I could in just these 45 minutes together, but obviously each child is his own universe. He requires his own individual plan and guidance, and I do a lot more, honestly, in each step. There's a lot more here, as you can see. We just kind of scratch the surface with all, but it gets really, really deep, and it's a lot more detailed, and I really want you to see changes in your home. I want you to get the rest you need, because I've been there. I know how hard it is, and honestly, now I'm still a busy mother, and when I don't get sleep, I can't be the mother I want to be. When I don't sleep, I don't have patience with my kids, and I don't feel in tune with anyone's needs, including myself. So really, it's all just about that decision for change. Just like I told you my story the night of the Cheerios episode, I was finished. That decision to make my life better was what finally got me the results, and you can have it too. You deserve to have a rested head to be the mother or to be the parent that you want to be, and that's why my three steps work. We get to the root 
of your child's sleep challenges. Like I said, we're not just sticking a Band-Aid on the problem temporarily. We want to solve everything long term. But I don't know how committed you are to making real changes in your life. So you might have to sit down with yourself and have a good talk with yourself. Is this the way I want my life to look? Do I feel like I'm giving my baby, my children, the best of me? Is being so tired and sleep deprived really helping me? Or is it really, really making me kind of go down the tubes with everything? Let me ask you a funny question. Would you ever do a science experiment on your baby? I doubt you would. I certainly hope you wouldn't. You know, why would you experiment on something so delicate like your child's sleep and your own emotional well-being? You have a choice. You know, you can keep trying different ideas, playing guessing games, not seeing results, getting frustrated, and basically not getting anywhere. But if you're done settling for that and you're ready for change, you know, you're ready to be energized, help your child sleep, you want to have a relationship with your spouse again, this is what I'm going to do for you, okay? I am personally setting aside some time the next 48 hours, so I can chat with you. I want to walk you through my step-by-step -step system, and I want to help you make a solid game plan to tackle your child's sleep. You know, you might be trying so hard to get your child to sleep that you're missing a really critical factor, and I promise you, whatever challenge you're facing, I have seen it. I've been doing this for a long time already, and I want to help you overcome it. So this is what I want to do. I want to chat with you. Here's how it works. I'm going to personally get on the phone with you for a 45 minute call. And what we're gonna do on this call together is a few things. Number one, we're gonna pinpoint the exact issues that are preventing you from sleeping. I'm gonna give you a roadmap how to get to the root of your child's sleep problems and how you can solve them. So if you've been trying different ideas, nothing's working, or you've just been thinking about change, then this call together is really gonna save your life because you're gonna know exactly what to do, you're gonna know what you've been doing wrong, and you're gonna learn how to solve your child's sleep issues long term. Number two, we're going to create a game plan together so that you can get sleep in the next few weeks and you don't have to run, through, you know, run around wondering what to do anymore. And third, we're going to go through it together. We're going to go through this outline. I'm going to make sure you understand it so that way you have the tools to empower yourself for sleep. Because listen, I'm a professional, but I'm also a fellow mother. And just imagine what your life will look like once you're sleeping. It's priceless. Everything's going to be so much better. You'll be able to function in such a higher place, more energized, happier. It's not like you're just regaining your sleep. You're regaining your entire life. You'll be the mother you want to be. You'll be the parent you want to be. You'll be the spouse you want to be. You'll be the worker you want to be. You'll just have that energy to really, really get back to yourself. So this is what you should do next if you want to schedule that call with me, okay? I have a few slots open, so go to this link, batyathebabycoach.com forward slash sleep. And you'll be able to schedule a time that works for you. And we can talk tomorrow. We can talk the next day. As soon as you're ready to really talk about this and really get going with your sleep. Now, you might be wondering how much this call costs. Don't worry. It's absolutely free. You're going to get a solid 45-minute consultation with me. costs nothing. After doing hundreds of these over the years, I see how powerful and how impactful this time together can be because you're going to regain control of your sleep and your life. You're going to see at the end of this call, your problems can be very easily evaporated. We can really much get yourself to a better place. But here is the catch. There is a catch, okay? This is not for everyone. Let me talk about what kind of parent this is for. This is for you if you know that your child can sleep better, your baby, your toddler, but you don't know how to get there. You really know that it's possible, but you have no idea what methods to use to get there. Or maybe you think it's not possible, but really an inkling of you knows that it's possible. <laughs> you're just nervous to make that step or you don't know what the game plan is. Or if you're really, really looking for change, you really want your life to be better, you really want to be rested, if this is for you, book a session right now to chat with me. If it's not, don't worry. But I really only want to chat with parents who want sleep and they're ready to get their life better, they're ready to get that rest back. Now you might be wondering why I'm doing this call. Okay, at the end of our call together, you might want my help. You might feel like you're really ready to make these changes in your life because I'm going to leave you with a really crystal clear game plan and you might want a little bit of my help to do that. So take a look at this link, pick whatever time works for you so we can set up a chat. And what you're gaining at the end is a happy, well-rested family. I'm going to tell you one last story, okay? This is a letter I got from Debbie in San Diego. Really hits home. What she wrote really, really resonated with me. I'm sure it's going to with you too. Hi, Batya. When I first contacted you, I really felt like my life was on edge. Yes, I loved my baby. Yes, I loved my husband. But I really felt like I was falling apart. After nine months of sleep deprivation, I really felt like my body couldn't take it anymore. I drank way too much coffee, ate too much chocolate, and gained a lot of weight back. But that didn't matter. What mattered to me was the fact that I was ashamed. I was ashamed because I was bitter and resentful towards my delicious baby Gwen. It wasn't her fault she was up all night, but I couldn't help but blame her. 
My sisters had babies that slept through the night on their own. Why wasn't mine? I napped at every opportunity during the day, but little 20-minute cat naps didn't really compensate for lost night sleep. I was really suffering. I felt distant from my husband because he tried to help, but he couldn't nurse Gwen, only I could, and that was really the only thing that calmed her down. I didn't know how I'd get over this because I didn't want to just leave her to cry it out. And honestly, even if I did, I didn't think that it would work. After working with you, though, I feel like I've gained my entire life back. I have energy to take care of my baby, energy to spend with my husband and friends, and I'm able to fill myself. I feel alive almost a year of living in a haze. I can smile again without drinking wine, and I feel like I love my baby more than ever because I enjoy her without feelings of mixed emotions and guilt. Thank you so much, Batya, for not just giving me back my sleep, but giving me back myself. That was an amazing, amazing email I got from, from Debbie. So Debbie, thanks for letting me share that with everyone. But it really just pinpoints how much happier she felt once she was sleeping. It was so much more than just getting sleep. It was the whole relationships that she had in her life and her relationship with herself. So I just wanted to share with you this story. Sleep affects every part of your life. It does affect your confidence, your emotional stability, you know, your overall happiness. If your baby isn't sleeping, you're not sleeping. So the least you can do for yourself is reach out and chat with me because trust me, you are doing yourself a favor. That's what separates happy parents who are rested from parents who let themselves continue to suffer. So check out this link, buyyouthebabycoach.com forward slash sleep. I really want to chat with you and I want to help you get to that better place in your life. So I'm looking forward to speaking with you.